How we doing, folks? This is Scott Moore from Whack Outdoors. I thought I'd just do a little live feed this evening. And the three topics that I want to briefly discuss is shot placement, approach to your stand, and what makes a deer a trophy. The fascinating and very good thing that I'm seeing now on Facebook and all these different groups is every single day there are five or six guys showing pictures and they're excited and they're saying this is my first deer with traditional equipment and I can't think of anything that's more exciting for the traditional community than for these folks to come on board and have success. And I think for a large part, their success can be contributed to the fact that there is a tremendous amount of information out right now. And uh, I love it. More power to them. But on the other end of the scale, there are a lot of folks coming on to these uh, Facebook groups asking questions uh, that are very uh, fundamental, very uh, beginner type questions. And that's great. That's what we're here for. We want to help them. And also that coupled with the couple of deer that I tried to help recover uh, that the hunters were certain they hit in the lungs and not necessarily. I wanted to just quickly go over the anatomy of a deer and where I personally like for my shot placement to be on a deer. Um, also, I see a lot of guys saying, they're maybe saying, I'm, I'm shooting a six inch group at 15 yards. Is that good enough to deer hunt? Um, I will tell you that myself personally, I have never claimed to be a fantastic shot. And I can assure you that I am not. You will never see me on the tournament trail standing on the podium. Uh, one, because I'm too busy to uh, dedicate the time and effort necessary to uh, be prepared for such an endeavor. Uh, again, I consider myself an average uh, archer. I consider my, my ability to shoot accurately average. Nothing great, not terrible. I attribute my success as a bow hunter more to a very intimate knowledge of the anatomy of the animals that I'm shooting and taking high percentage shots based on that knowledge. So what I'm saying is when I watch an animal in the woods and I'm looking at how that animal's standing and their posture, and I'm looking and I'm literally seeing a 3D image inside that animal of, of where all the internal organs are. And when I see an angle that gives me the greatest room for error, that's the shot that I take. I take shots that allow me to be high, low, left to right, several inches, and that shot turns out with a good income, or with a good outcome. Uh, with today's resources on Google, YouTube, this type of thing, you can look at multiple images of the anatomy of the game animals that we are pursuing. I encourage you to do so, but I just, I got this uh, mural, graph, poster, whatever you want to call it. Um, back in another lifetime, I did a lot of instructing as, as a bow hunting instructor. Uh, that's why I have this. But um, to get right to it, and again, a lot of you folks know this, some folks don't. This is for the ones that don't. Uh, when you look at a deer and you're looking at the bone structure, you have the leg bone. This is also leg bone. And this is the shoulder blade. This is what everybody's concerned about. Can I get a broad head and an arrow through that shoulder blade? And if you look at the anatomy of this deer, uh, it's good to be able to get through that shoulder blade. But really, you have no business being near it to make a good lethal shot on a deer. And this is the heart, this is the lungs, this is the liver, 
and this is the diaphragm. That diaphragm is vital. That diaphragm makes the uh, lung, uh, the rib cage, the the, uh, the compartment that's holding the lungs and the heart is uh, pressurized. And that diaphragm is what keeps that pressurized, sealed up, and uh, working. The the reason I'm doing this and, and the, the specific point that I want to make, I, I see a lot of guys that want to get real tight against this leg because they're, they're going for this heart shot. But if you look at the lungs, the lungs are a lot wider up and down towards the back than they are in the front. And if you look at this deer from the top down, the width of these lungs correlate with their uh, dimensions up and down. These lungs are a lot wider side to side in the back as they are in the front. And even though it's not on this graph, the backbone comes along right here and then dips down really low, right above these lungs and then up the neck. So a lot of what's behind this shoulder blade is a relatively heavy backbone. So if we keep our shots pretty far forward on this game animal, the way this deer is standing, if we shoot high or we shoot a little bit to the left, I know the, the phone's turned around for you folks, so it's looking different. But, but the bottom line, if you're aiming to hit this deer in the heart lungs right here, it doesn't take too much to shoot this deer too high and too forward. And I have helped recover and look for a whole lot of deer that the individual that shot the deer swore he double lunged and his arrow ended up up in here somewhere. We all know deer duck, they move when that bow goes off a lot of times. So again, to leave myself the largest room for air I personally stay well away from the front of these lungs. I almost always take a pretty good quartering away shot at a deer. I like to uh, shoot a deer a lot farther back than most folks do. Uh, this is almost midship on the deer. And if you take a quartering away shot at a deer, that your arrow is entering the deer way back at the last rib up under that backbone, ranging forward, we'll say to the armpit on the off side, you have a chance of putting that arrow through um, the liver, the lungs, the heart, any combination of the three. So I'm not gonna belabor this point. Me personally, I just about hit a deer midship with the air ranging forward uh, through the liver, the top of the liver, into the lungs and heart. Uh, the reason I do that on a quartering away animal, again, I don't have a good way to explain this, but uh, I, I told you that I, I take shots at animals that the uh, angle of the animal makes the kill area for me as big as possible. And the lungs are the widest and the tallest at the back and you have the liver and the diaphragm. So if I'm taking a quartering away shot this way into this animal, if I shoot too far back, there's a good chance I'm gonna get the liver and the back of the offside lung. If I shoot dead center, I got a good chance of getting the liver and some of both lungs. If I shoot too far forward, there's a very good chance I'm gonna get one lung in the heart or possibly a little bit of the liver in the lung and the heart. So quartering away, shooting far enough back, gives me a cross section width-wise that I can count on my arrow uh, doing what it needs to do. And also up and down. You can hit a deer back here pretty dang on high and you're cutting through the top of the lungs and you can hit the deer pretty dang on low and you're cutting through the heart. So again, a quartering away shot just about midship, 
has had the best results for me. And I just ask you to consider that. Now, the specific question I got in a private uh, message that I wanted to actually do a little diagram of is a stand approach. That's okay. So stand approach. And the point that I want to make about stand approach, I'm going to make this simple so it applies to any situation. I purposely held off till most of you guys have got going with the season to cover this ground because I'm hoping that some of your uh, personal experiences already this year will uh, play this out. See if I can do this so it looks right. Okay. These are feed trees. This is the wind direction. You want to be downwind of the feed trees. So your stand is right there. So you have your feed trees, you have your wind direction, and you have your stand. And again, just make this simple and quick. It's our human nature. We want to go in to the back side of our stand because we do not want to walk where the deer are going to be. So what I run into and the individual that asked me this question specifically had going on, his stand approach looked like this. Make it in red. His stand approach was like this. Okay, so here's his issue. The deer want to approach these feed trees with the wind in their favor too. And because he has taken this circuitous route into the back of his stand, he has effectively cut off this entire area from deer approaching because they do not want to cross his scent path. Now, I know some of you are already saying, I got good stuff, I got good spray on my boots, I never get winded. The deer walk right across my path, they follow me to my stand. I'm proud for you, I'm glad that happened for you. Uh, my personal experience, a lot of times, it doesn't matter what you do, unless you have a helicopter set you down in your stand and you walk on the ground, there are gonna be deer and hogs that absolutely will not cross your path where you walked in. Or a lot of times you have deer that are maybe tolerant of that. So it looks like they cross that and they have no reaction. So you think that they don't know that you've walked there. I can assure you they know. If you think of beagle dogs at the airport that are uh, looking for drugs and fruit and stuff brought in from uh, foreign countries, and I've watched them work, you can take a, what to say, an illegal substance, regardless what it is, and you can wrap that in saran wrap, and you can bury that in a can of freshly ground coffee, and you can put that in your bag. And that little beagle walks over and smells that can and wags his tail because he knows there's something in that can besides coffee. And we can buy scent suits and wash our clothes and put the sprays on our boots. And all that stuff absolutely helps. But I can assure you very few deer are just totally oblivious to the fact that you've walked into that stand. Uh, I think all the efforts that we take for scent reduction uh, minimizes their ability to know how long it's been since we've come through. But I think it's very difficult to hide from them the fact that we have. But again, very common scenario. We got feed trees, prevailing wind. We hook into our stand this way to not walk out in front of our stand. And the problem is the deer want to come into these feed trees with the wind in their favor too, and we are blocking them from approaching the feed trees with our path. And again, I understand some folks absolutely will not agree with this. I most often in a situation like that, 
I walk right through the feed trees to get to my stand and count on getting shots of deer on either side of my scent trail before they hit it. And again, you have a doe walking through, she's got a buck behind her, the doe smells you, she turns wrong side out, then the buck doesn't come. I, I get it. It doesn't matter what we do, there are circumstances where it is a negative. I get that. But just food for thought. And for what this is worth, deer very seldom approach just directly upwind. A lot of times deer come in uh, diagonal to the wind. But in this situation for me, if the wind's coming this way and I'm gonna be right here and I'm counting on the deer coming from all behind me to come to this feed tree, what I am more than likely gonna do is I am going to come in with the wind and my approach to my stand is gonna be like this. So all this area is free for the deer to approach without winding me or crossing my scent path. And the ones that do come around this way, I make sure that where I walk to my stand is out in front of me enough that if they hit my scent trail and they stand there and ponder that scent trail, I can shoot them while they're thinking about it. I make sure that my entry into my stand is as much to the side as possible, but still in front of me enough that if an animal approaches this way and hits my scent trail, I have a shot at them. Okay, so that's shot placement, stand approach. Last thing I wanna finish with is what makes a deer a trophy. And I'm gonna share with you what makes a deer a trophy for me. To me personally, what makes a deer a trophy is the circumstances surrounding the shot opportunity at that deer. I have about three feeders that I keep active and I have hogs on those feeders and I will tell you that I will shoot a hog on site without mercy. Big ones, small ones, little ones, girls, boys, although I do try really hard, just like with deer, to shoot mature boars. I do let a lot of hogs slide in hopes of getting a shot at a mature boar. But the point of it is, uh, hogs are different. Every hog I see needs a good shooting. Now deer, I have the feeders I hunt the hogs on, and two feeders in particular, I have does that I have literally watched graze their fawns on that feeder. And I just absolutely do not have any uh, desire to shoot those does on that feeder. I'm not going to do it. And this is just the quirk of the human mind. Because if I go out, oh, and also I've had some pretty, some pretty significant bucks uh, come to those feeders. And I'm not holier than thou or anything like that, but I had some pretty good bucks that I just did not shoot. It's a personal choice. I didn't feel that there would be any satisfaction in shooting that deer with his head in a pile of corn under a feeder. I'm just not going to do it. But if I turn right around the next day and I go out on a hardwood ridge and I find an acorn tree dropping with a lot of sign under it and I put a stand up, there's a high likelihood that a much lesser buck would come through there and I would shoot him. And I'd be darn happy with the situation. And that's the whole point. It's because of the situation. It's because I felt like I was hunting. It's because the experience was more uh, wild, for lack of a better way of putting it. So the reason I mentioned all that, we all do this for the enjoyment of being in the outdoors. And we fall into a trap on social media of uh, if you don't shoot a really big buck, you're not hitting the mark, so to speak. There's a lot of inexperienced guys out there. A lot of them are shooting their first deer. That's fantastic. Uh, even if you have shot a lot of deer with a uh, compound bow and you've transitioned to a traditional bow, if you haven't found out already, you will find out very quickly that it is not the same animal and harvesting a deer with a traditional bow is much more difficult. So 
my take on this and the thought I want to leave you with is, uh, to me, when we hunt deer with traditional equipment, we are hunting shot opportunities. We are not hunting deer. So I would say that if you get a slam dunk shot at an unsuspecting deer that is standing at the right angle, go for it, make a good shot, have a good recovery, be proud of that deer. Uh, antler size means nothing to me, and I'm going to tell you why. If I shoot a buck that scores 135, there's going to be five more bucks on social media that afternoon that scores 150 and above. If I shoot a buck that scores 150, there's going to be some clown on there that's going to tell me you should let that deer grow up and wait until he's bigger. So it doesn't matter what you do. There's some folks that are not going to like it. And I encourage you not to be pressured by them to make the decision of how you conduct yourself in the field. When we are in the field and we are hunting these animals, a lot of times we're by ourselves. No one will ever know what we did or how we did it. That's where character comes in. Character is what we do when we know no one's watching and no one will find out. Okay? I do what makes me happy as long as it is legal, and I can go home and sleep at night making the decision to have done that. Uh, the best way that I can put this is, I now have grandchildren. And when my grandchildren come to my home, they look up on the wall and they see the deer heads on the wall of bucks that I have shot in the past. And they are excited for Grandpa Scott to tell them the story of the deer that he shot and to relive that moment. And I never want a circumstance to come up to where when I explain how I shot that deer on the wall, that story has to be fabricated because I don't want anyone to know how I really come to shoot that deer. So food for thought. If you're going to shoot a good buck and he's going to be on the wall for a long time, make sure that that deer for years and years and years brings back a fond memory every time you look at it and not a little twinge of guilt because you know how you came by that deer and uh, it wasn't the most sportsmanlike conduct. So God bless you all. I hope you have a fantastic season. As always, this is Scott Moore from Whack Outdoors. Hope to see you in the woods and on the trail.